<clears throat> on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Heads Consortium, I would like you to welcome you to the 2022 Best Practices Show, celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Victor Ray, and I'll be presenting the speakers for the breakout sessions of this month. Before we begin, we request your support with the following. Please change your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and have a link to The session is being recorded. This presentation will be in English. We will have the time for questions at the end of the presentation. Finally, we invite you to see the QR code that the staff will share to all participants to complete the electronic evaluation form for this session before you leave this room. For the virtual participants, the link to the evaluation will be available in the chat. Please make sure you select the time and date for this session. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to us. Now, we're ready to start. The title of this present of the presentation is Starting a Path Forward. Individualized and professional learning to provide equitable access. Please welcome speaker, Dr. Ole Pinedo Caballero from Global Education Exchange Opportunity. Good afternoon, Victor, and thank you for having us here. Uh, to everyone in the room and those who are joining us, thank you for being here. It's, I understand, 2.30 afternoon in Puerto Rico. There are, more, there are nicer things to do, but it's a, it's a rainy day. So if you're here, we're going to have a very meaningful exchange. Uh, my goal with this conversation is to share lessons learned of a project that Global Education Exchange had the privilege of collaborating with the Puerto Rico Department of Education, along with other partners during the 2020-2021 school year. So my uh, client or the focus of impact are the teachers. We usually talk about individualizing learning for students. In this case, Global Education Exchange, our main interest is how do we provide equitable access to teachers to have meaningful learning experiences to improve teaching and learning processes in the classroom, in the public school classroom or in the private school classroom. So what we are going to do in this uh, 30 to 40 minute presentation is to share with you what we did in order to collect and analyze data and then what was the theoretical framework that we used to analyze the data, what were the things we did what were our findings? And as a result, what do we, uh, what does the Puerto Rico Department of Education and us as an organization that works in professional development has as a gain as a result of this intervention? Um, I wanna thank all the colleagues that supported in this project, specifically uh, Claribel Ojeda and all the team in Puerto Rico in the Global Education uh, Opportunities Organization because the reason that we're here, we can share this information, required that a lot of talented professionals work when we were deeply immersed in the pandemic. So it required sometimes letting, putting aside our fears uh, because of COVID and focusing on something that was a priority. So the objectives, the three of the three areas that I want to share with you today would be how data from the technology uses and perception survey was analyzed to generate categories to ease interpretation and design an individualized technopedagogical plan. Then share how teachers, schools, and state had equal access to information and how they used that information to provide synchronous and asynchronous self-directed training. And Lastly, would be to share the impact of a one-year project. This was, this was only from April 1st, 2020 to August of 2021. So it was actually a very short time period and it had a very large impact. Usual implementations tend to be very small, uh, focusing on one school district. This was a system-wide project. 
And so what we what happened in this situation, uh, we had just uh, gone through Hurricane Maria. So that had an impact in 2017, that had an impact in the infrastructure, both schools and also technology infrastructure as well as electricity. That is actually a view from Manatee where our offices are located and that's what you could see at the end of the streets. Um, right after that, Puerto Rico, California and states in the Southeast of the United States were awarded restart funds from the US government to rebuild. From those funds, the Puerto Rico Department of Education did an RFP, we competed and the RFP was approved in 2019, but it was not until 2020 that because of different issues uh, was a delay in the implementation. And what did we have in Puerto Rico by 2020? We had Christmas earth earthquakes in the southern part of the island that had effects throughout the island. And, and that's actually something that we're very sad because some of our schools, thank God that it occurred during the night, some of our schools, their infrastructure, but that had an impact also in the psyches of a community that was working on rebuilding after Hurricane Maria. Now we're struck with another uh, injury, I would say. And then right after that, we are we have to close our schools because of the COVID uh, pandemic. We were being closed and then we were being required, you know, and I'm including myself as teachers and professionals to pivot immediately to continue providing services when there was uncertainty in terms of how we were living, how we were communicating, how we were socializing. And teachers usually are the backbone of society and are the ones that are there to provide hope for the children and the communities that you can continue. But they also were hindered because now they were required to be te to teach in online and not all teachers and by that time had the technopedagogical competencies required to provide instruction. Children were used to having those who did have technology used it more for entertaining. So it required a change in mindsets from how a school director communicated with their teachers, how a system communicated with its schools, how parents communicated with schools, how children learn. And so in that, in the midst of that, uh, that was the situation, you know, and if you see from 2020 to 2021, and if we took that to 2022, the population of children and teachers have been decreasing as well. So there was, the, there's been changes, constant changes. And so providers of uh, technical support, like Global Education Exchange and other entities, when we were called in to begin working in this uh, the Department of Education INNOVA or DE INNOVA projects, we were there to actually provide those tools and support services so that we could collaborate with the system to get the, get the, to develop the competencies for teaching and learning with technology and also all the other aspects of infrastructure. In the case of GEO, we were working with the assessment. That's when we came in. And so that's what, that's the main question that we had to solve in order to be part of this transformation in this entire school system of Puerto Rico. Because again, this was something that needed to happen island-wide, you know, Vieques and Culebra included, you know. Our question was how data, and let me stop right here. We actually, one of the things we had, we, we signed the contract in April and we had to be providing administering an assessment in May. So we already had a collaborative agreement with the Florida Center for Instructional Technology. We actually had surveyed, uh, looked at the work they were doing uh, in many places, in many schools. That was what we understood was the most comprehensive assessment instrument because, because it actually was looking at technology uses, not only from the perception of the, the teacher, of their use, but the perception of the teacher of whether the students were using technology. And for those, that was very important because many times when we do assessments, we're only looking at the person providing the instruction. 
And that gives you only one piece of the information. But when you look at how, what's the perception of the frequency of use of my students in the classroom. And if you have a teacher that says, oh, I use technology all the time, but then they respond, my, my students use technology once a month, once every two months. What do you see there? There is a disparity, but that's the way that we were able to get the best data possible to support. So that's why we went, there is enough literature and we can later go to the Florida Center for Instructional Technology to see what research is out there. You can Google it as well. But we used that survey and we were able to adapt it. So our question was, how data from the tubes was analyzed to generate categories to ease interpretation and device of an individualized technology plan. And the fact is that we had freedom in terms of what instrument we were going to use, but we were required to create individualized plans by the department, by the Puerto Rico Department of Education, so that they were then able to provide individualized education or training to the teachers according to the level. So that was actually a very ambitious project. It was actually a very, for us educators and researchers, it was a very exciting opportunity. You know, seldom do you have the opportunity to look at everyone at the same time. So the good thing about the, the, the technology uses and perception survey is that it's based on the technology integration matrix, you know, developed, tested, validated, used in the United States and in other places around the world. And they have an entire way of looking at using also tools for observation, coaching, and many others and developing a lesson plan. So it had enough meat that would, would allow us to work with teachers after we got the data. So the matrix tells us based on the responses, what uh, we then were in Puerto Rico, and actually that is actually credit to the team, you know, that was working in this project. We wanted to use the matrix different from other people working with the matrix in other states. We wanted the matrix to help us develop a way to, to develop a perfil, a profile, so that we knew where teachers were teaching. And so that required statistical reanalysis. Re and so we were going to group in three groups and the matrix has five categories. The categories are an entry beginner stage. The middle stage is competent, was gonna be competent, and that, uh, that, that, that calls for teachers who are in an adoption or an adaptation stage. And then we have the third category, which are teachers that are more competent using technology. Uh, and that would be the proficient level where teachers would be in infusion and transformation. So this is what the technology uses and perception survey looks like. And it's one of the uh, elements of the team tools. You know, it has a whole spectrum of tools that we can use later. And it has those seven categories. And within those seven categories, then we also have different items. So it was a very robust instrument that allowed us to get information from teachers in Puerto Rico never before. We've never before done that. So we were able to see from the technology access and support, preparation for technology use, perceptions of technology use, confidence and comfort, uh, technology integration, teacher and student use of technology, and technology skills and usefulness. And those seven categories are very important because then it goes into more in depth. It's, it was, we, we didn't wanna use something that would tell us a teacher can use Excel or a teacher can use PowerPoint because that would be very narrow. We, what we wanted to do is look at the underlying competencies that are required for effective uses of technology. So in order to do that, we had actually made uh, the rest of the team working in this project. We did a very good, uh, uh, we, not only did the Florida Center for instructional technology license us, us the product, but they allowed us to do a cultural adaptation as well as a translation of the tool. And in addition to allowing us, they were willing to work with us almost weekly. You know, we had meetings with our faculty. So this was a very uh, enriching opportunity because then we were learning at the same time. They were learning about the 
about their research and we were learning about their tools. So it was actually a symbiotic relation that uh, I think is part of what HEX cultivates. You know, how do we get engaged throughout different institutions, places in and outside of Puerto Rico? And so part of our cultural adaptation included the translation from English to, to Spanish. We did a pilot study of that translated instrument in Puerto Rico with experts to make sure that we had done, it was actually language appropriate for our context. We uploaded the survey and then we did an online administration. When you look at online administrations, in his, what is a good, a good measure of participation in a survey for you historically? Any has an idea, anyone has an idea what would be the people that are in the Zoom classroom? Any ideas of what would you say is a good number for participation in a in a survey? 10%, 20%, 30 percent, 40 percent, 50%. Okay. Anyone? I'm gonna leave that question and I'm gonna share with you. This is what it looked like. And so what we did was not only translate, but we also develop assessments because initially we were looking at teachers and then we were asked to look at guidance counselors, social workers, and school principals. So in our assessment, when we looked at assessing our students, per, our perceived use of our students, then we had the principals who were looking at their perceived use of technology by their teachers because that was their unit. So we had enough data right there to, to look at the entire system from different perspectives. So what we did was that one of the things that uh, was very important, particularly for, the, for, for an assessment looking at teachers, is what are the underlying assumptions behind the questions? And the underlying assumptions behind the questions are that the more is that when the, the answers were going to be, if you answer one way or the other, what you were telling us is that you were using the technology more for student, or stu, was it, there was more student ownership or less student ownership. The more student ownership was a reflection that there was more proficient use of technology because then teachers felt comfortable enough to allow students to engage and decide the tools they were gonna use. Whereas when a teacher was in an entry level, the teachers were focusing more on how do you use the technology? How do you, how do you turn it on? How do you go into a browser? When you go into Teams, what are the rules you wanna follow? You know, they were more interested in how to use the tool. Later, they were go, more going more at a, at to the place of more com complex uses of technology to the level of then student ownership and creation with technology. So that was what we were going to do. We were gonna be looking at teachers when we looked at their responses to determine whether their responses told us they were more in the basic stage, you know, in the introductory stage, or if they were in the proficient stage. And remember this, the intent of this was to individualize then what they were gonna receive for professional development. In the student scale, we had, we divided by frequency of use. So if they were using multiple times a week or one type of week, depending on what was it that they were using, remember there were seven categories, set, uh, so seven scales. So one, when we were looking at the student scale, those are the different devices that they were gonna be self-reporting. And they were telling how they were using and if they were using it in cooperative groups or self-driven or student level or as a communication tool. So each of the two not only talked to us about where the teachers were, but also in what kind of environment was the technology used. Again, when we went in the student scale, we were looking at desktop computers, simulations, publishing software. So depending on what kind of tool they were using and the frequency they were using, you see uh, there is a, you know, as, as users of technology, some technology requires and some applications require 
much more self-engagement with the tool and it allows you for more creative uses of technology where our others will, will be more repetitive you know of what you use and so what what the team did was that now that we have the information to interpret the information because it was actually such a huge instrument we aggregated the data into five different subscales according to whether they require more creative uses or they would be requiring less. For example, when we look at level B, uh, we look at uh, programs for practice. When you practice a sheet where you're actually writing or you're drawing or you're following, you're responding to an exam that requires you to do something, it's a command driven use that it requires less creativity than if you're going into a drawing or an editing of video kind of software so pretty much that was actually how we segmented the also the, the responses and then when we went to social workers and guidance counselors instead of having five soft scales we had four because then we were looking at according to what the guidance counselors and t and, and, and social workers do in schools we were able to to aggregate the, the, the tools differently because they work more one-to-one -one and if they have groups, that what they do with the groups is different. So we actually also align it to what they do. And this is an example of a result. So this is one of, this is actual data. Um, when we were looking at this particular um, um, in um, question, and each of, again, we're looking at the five subscales from hardware, practice demonstration, internet and communication, the blue, information management and communication, the D, which would be more Excel and programs like that, or design and creativity. Uh, you could see that we had teachers who said, for example, I find a hardware very useful, but my skill is poorer than what I have, 52.75. So what we have in the second part of this screen would be after the intervention that they were given, you can see that when we administer the post-assessment, because we had a pre-assessment that we administered in May of 2020, and the post-assessment was in May of 2021, you can see that now the usefulness is still, you know, it, it, it's almost the same, 65.54%, but the teachers now were, and the, 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 the entire group, because this pre and post assessment is only those who completed both, because we didn't have one and a half people that only came afterwards, was that there was an increase. So that now you have 63.75%. So you can see how, after an inter the intervention was very useful because you can see that practice and demonstration, they thought it was very useful. But then after a after fact, the principals, the teachers, and the social workers, they, maybe they're not as useful. You know, maybe they're uh, less useful than the, in the first, but then they are able to use them more, 38.71%, if you see there, then, if, then when you start it when you skill, the, the, the skill you said you had when you started the, the intervention. So definitely um, just to, uh, the assessment uh, was very robust. The way that it was aggregated, the data, the assumptions established to determine how we would analyze all of that information for 30,000 teacher was very good because it actually gave us, diff it was very granular. So it gave us information that we could later use with the different uh, for, for providing professional development. And we had enough information. We were going to have enough information to guide the learning processes that are going to happen afterwards. So the second question we have now is how teachers, schools, and state had equal access to information technology, synchronous, asynchronous, and self-directed training. What, remember this, the project, this was part of Restart Clans. The intent was re-equip schools with technology, but now technology was not being used to complement or supplement learning. 
it was the way teachers and students were going to be learning because we were immersed in the pand in, in, in the pandemia. So to do that, the Department of Education required that we design an individualized plan. That was the cover page of the individualized plans. All the educators that took the assessment in July, by, by the beginning of August, had their individualized plans. Their training began, began in July. The technology literacy training began in July. And then the technology integration training began in August. So all of the people that were in the system who took the assessment had their individualized plan, uh, profile so that they could use that for designing training. But also we wanted the school, the, the teacher to have data on themselves but we wanted the principal to have data on their faculty. And we wanted the directors, the different um, managers from the different programs to have data on their the different content area, especially. So that's part of what was provided to the department. And so it was provided through uh, an application called, we call Geo app, that app. And so a teacher could not see the information of another teacher and in principle could not see information of another school. We were very careful that we did not want people to think that they were actually ex being exposed. You know, we wanted to, we were very cautious because the idea was for this to be an academic intervention. But so the group that was at the higher end, the, the, the people that owned the project, they had access to everything. The operation managers had access to their particular, particular so the director of the Spanish program, language arts would have access to their teachers. And then the principals would have the plans pre-post and the school profile. That way they can support the teachers to work on uh, when they needed a teacher to mentor another teacher or when they needed to see who could be the mentor of the, of the group. And then the teachers had their own individualized assessment. So at the end of this year, remember, we're thinking, what was the impact in terms of were we able to fulfill the, the, the target? And why is this important and why did we want to share this at HEADS? We want to share this at HEADS because uh, HEADS consists of many faculty from different programs throughout the nation who work with Hispanics. And this was a great opportunity. The assessment is available both in English and in Spanish. So it can be used worldwide. And also it can be used to develop future programs, you know, the, for, the, for how do you train, how do you educate uh, uh, the principal, the guidance counselor, the social worker, and the teacher. Because again, if, if this is something, if we're talking about teaching with technology and our teachers lack the basic academic competencies to do it, then we're not providing equitable access to learning to the children. So we're thinking of from this project, what happened? So we part of the things that we have is we have actually a, a GPS driven software that we actually were able to look each of the purple dots is a school. The largest dot is a school with more teachers and students where are the smaller dots are smaller schools. But what you can see from one, from the pre to the post is that the darker the, the town, the more proficient the, the teachers are as a result of the training. And so um, that's part of what you can see. And if you go to the website, the GEOS website, and we can do that in a minute, you can then go to, we can go and see how the different regions are. And you can actually see that information. So what was the changing level when teachers started? Again, we were looking at if you, we go back again, the sample size in the pre-assessment was 25,000. We had over 94% of teachers who took the, the assessment. That's actually very, very rewarding to see that kind of commitment from educators to do that. The second assessment, there was more competition for other things. It was the end of the school year of 2021. And so we had a lower participation rate. It was around 84. Of course, Mayagüez had it over 90% participation, but, uh, but if overall 84 is also very good. And so um, what we see is that you have introductory adaptation and infusion. You have a decrease in teachers who are at the introductory level after the year intervention of professional development. The professional development was provided by different groups, including us, 
we did it through micro credentials and said that group increased in adaptation and adoption. And then we also had an increase in infusion and transformation. So you can see that um, we had, there was an increase in, in technopedagogical profile or teachers perceived knowledge and use of technology. And those are the teachers that are in the school system now in 2022. So how individualizing professional learning provided an equitable access to teachers? So our, our, our main uh, conclusion from this data is that we provide trainings sometimes that are just required, but seldom do we actually begin a training that targets usefulness and skill. You know, usually a teachers take a workshop because it's required, but in this case, they had, they were grouped by whether they were principals, whether they were social workers, whether they were guidance counselors, and then whether they were in an introductory level, they were required X number of hours and X, uh, X number of workshops versus another level. So it proves that like with students in a classroom, when you individualize professional learning, you are in fact providing equitable access to learning. And in this case with teachers, um, seldom, it's important that we also take into consideration uh, the teacher's voice and the teacher's choice. And this was part of what happened last year. So in conclusion, you know, my call to action, um, when I, um, last year, um, I had the opportunity to present uh, with the people at the Florida Center of Instructional Technology at, an, at a conference at the university. And actually they have this, uh, in the Museum of Anthropology, they had this exhibition. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually saw they participated in the exhibition online and it was about Puerto Rico. And so one of the professors, they came to provide support after Maria and they, they collected tordos, signs, and they created that dress and she participated in many uh, different parades just to raise consciousness. So I think that um, in summary, you know, what I, what I think is important and I think is what unites us all, you know, whether we are like in our case, we are providers of, of professional development services, technical support, uh, being here with uh, university professors and people from the heads organization if we continue to, you know, I, I, we strong, I share that belief that education, research, art, and communication are vehicles for equal participation in high quality teaching and learning. And uh, we want to continue to collaborate to achieve justice for educators and those for society worldwide. And so, because that's, you know, and teachers are at the root of it. So whatever we can do to support what they do, you know, What's happening today in Puerto Rico comes to say they have a voice, they have a choice, and we're here to support that and create the conditions so that we can all learn uh, and, and share. So say, thank you for this opportunity, and I'm open to questions. If there is any questions or comments, both from our, press, uh, our audience here or our audience on, online. Thank you very much. Um, Really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm Dr. Carmen Sibidanes. Uh, okay. Okay. Eh, 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 it has to be online and the, the definition or how the perception of, of hybrid teaching and learning. There, there are items that talk about, uh, about, about um, because of the matrix uh -huh. that talk about the different environments, whether it is collaborative, cooperative, uh, and so it, it actually talks about different ways of learning. So yes, they, the way that questions are structured, I would say that they all in a way would provide you information on what would actually is the perceived use of the teacher and the perceived use of the teacher by their students. So in a way they will provide, uh, because I think that the issue, the underlying issue of 
hybrid learning. And actually, the you know, in the conversations with the faculty at USF, is is there, a, is there a significant use of technology? Are we using whether it is hybrid or whether it is being in the classroom with the students? Is the use you're giving to technology significant or not? And so the assessment. We did, in addition to the assessment, we also did a pilot of a coaching. We did a, techno a technology coaching project in 11 schools as well to see what was happening. Uh, so instead of looking at hybrid, we were looking at what um, there are there are specific. One of the things, if and I invite you to see, you know, to look at the matrix, and we would love to work with you on something later. But mm -hmm. when you look at um, at how do you how do you teach, you know, the matrix will provide you. Uh, a student do, doing that, a teacher doing, so it's specific. So in terms of, uh, and, and it, it was in the seven categories. So how many items? It's approximately a hundred items. It's a long assessment that takes less than 20 minutes because it's actually online. So you go mm -hmm. and you're actually, it's very smooth. We have it in English, we have it in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so, and I would love to, I, one of the things that I was talking in, in our, is that we would love to do something with private schools. We, would, we think Puerto Rico, it would actually be interesting to have a technopedagogical profile for Puerto Rico and then look at how that relates to the teaching and, and learning outcomes long term. Because we definitely had a shift in education as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's we had we had a lot of loss and we had a lot of grief, but we also had a lot of learning mm -hmm. and we continue to learn it hasn't stopped uh so those are the two things because one of the things we wanted to shy away is we don't we did not want to say this works this doesn't work right. no we wanted to see because even when you look at teachers at an introductory level and i was talking to some teachers earlier from another session if you're introducing the simulation mm -hmm. application probably you're going to be wanting to guide a student and you're also trying to learn the tools. So you're going to be more of an introductory, you're gonna be showcasing behaviors of teaching related to introductory. The idea is be to be conscious that that's happening and to make sure that your ways of learning move to a significant use. Progress, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, very so nice. that's, uh, that's where we were. So Victor, I guess that we, Victor has something he wants to share. There is our information. So you can contact us and I'll stay here for any other particular questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Huh? Okay, any other questions or comments from, from our, our participants online? I don't see any chat. Okay. There. Okay, so if there is any, I think some questions were already answered, but if there are any questions, fine? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna stay here, that way we allow time for the evaluation of this workshop to be done, but we appreciate Global Education Exchange Opportunities is actually an organization in Puerto Rico. We are based in Manatee and we provide services island-wide. So. Uh, we had, uh, we wanted to share, you know, you can look us up at our web, at our web page and we want to continue the conversation. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Odette, for such a great presentation. We invite you to take advantage of this moment and view the evaluation for this session. There is a QR code that you can scan in order to access the evaluation. For the virtual participants, the link up to the, to the evaluation is in the chat. Please make sure you select the time and date for this session.